Okay, so this is Mark Goring, and tonight we're going to uh, we're going to do a little study session here on on understanding the balance sheet. We have um, about sixty co-ops or sixty people uh, signed up for the for the session, and um, um, about twenty people are registered for tonight's uh, online webinar. And so far, we have about 10 people in the room. So um, I'll try not to restart the session if in three minutes the other 10 people come. Um, and I do just want to make one, you know, announce one more time that we'll be using the GoToWebinar um, toolbar for interacting. Feel free to use it. Um, and Steve, it was uh, the, the Corp Grocer article um, is posted on the file repository. And also in the Cup Grocer website, it was uh, published uh, September, October 2007, and um, it pretty much describes uh, what we're going to cover tonight. So it's a it's a good um, good companion piece to the webinar for sure. All right, um, I'll just show you a list here of who has signed up. Sorry for the small type. That's the smallest type that we'll have on the screen tonight. Um, you see quite a range of, of co-ops participating. Thanks so much. Um, at the end of the session, we'll have, um, uh, I hope, uh, when we end the session, the uh, evaluation will pop up on your screen. Your comments uh, have been really helpful to us um, as we have been learning how to use this, uh, this new technology for, for being better directors. So, Right away, we get into um, uh, audience participation. Thank you for uh, for sharing your ideas uh, uh, and answers to this question. So here we are. We find ourselves directors of these food co-ops. Um, what financial indicators will help us understand the organization's financial condition? So, of course, I have a few ideas in mind, and um, we're going to work on some of them tonight. But I just wonder uh, what you what you think. So um, again, we're going to be using the GoToWebinar interface. Uh, feel free to give it a try right now. And um, you know, other people who are on the session won't be able to, to hear you, but I will um, be sharing your responses uh, as they come in. So what do you think? As directors, what financial indicators will help us understand the organization's financial condition? So what comes to mind for you? Sorry to put you on the spot right away. <laughs> All right, thank you. We got some coming in here. Sales, gross income. Uh, let's see. I have to expand my little thing here. Net income. Thank you. What else comes to mind when you? Um, good. Earnings, so that'd be uh, earnings, equity, assets, liabilities. Excellent. Anything else come to mind for for folks? That's really good. We're going to dive right into some of those topics. All right. So if you are thinking about this question uh, over the next few minutes, feel free to, uh, uh, there we go, expenses, good. Mm -hmm. Feel free to keep sending them on in. So you see that we actually want to be able to kind of think about, gee, I wonder, I wonder uh, what indicators we would be thinking about and, um, and not just, um, and not just be following along. So we're going to work on understanding some of these ideas uh, here tonight. So um, kind of the way that we describe it is uh, growth. So that would be not just sales, but kind of dealing with the question of our sales going up, down, or staying the same. Uh, what, what, is the, uh, what is the pattern? Um, profitability gee as a result of all of our um, all of our 
sales and all of our expenses, um, are we making money here? And those two, um, those two ideas are found on the income statement, which we're going to um, just briefly describe tonight and not go into much detail because this session is focused on the balance sheet. But basically on the income statement, you'll see the sales at the top and usually the profitability at the bottom. And everything in between is, you know, a tremendous amount of information. Um, and we would suggest that if you really have a handle on what's going on with these two, um, that really is telling you, telling you a lot. Um, two other key ideas we're going to talk about tonight are the ideas of solvency and uh, liquidity. These, um, these end up being relationships, financial relationships. Uh, solvency is, is really looking at the relationship between how much debt there is in the organization and how much equity there is. And don't worry, we're going to really go into those topics. But equity means, you know, how much money is really generated, you know, by and from within the organization. And debt is is money that's owed. Who owns the stuff that we have? Is it is it owned because we have um, that we've taken on debt, or is it owned because we have the um, built the financial strength, you know, in in the organization? So it's looking at that the, those relationships, and um, and then liquidity. Is, is really a measure of our, or the, the business's ability to pay. Um, you know, are we able to meet our obligations, um, usually in the, in the shorter term rather than, um, or in the, we'll be, we'll be talking about the current ratio uh, primarily, so that's a 12-month window. All right, so um, these, are, these are four key uh, indicators that, that um, that we think are important for directors to really um, be paying attention to. And in particular, we're going to be focused on, on these, and then we're going to show how these um, show up on the balance sheet. All right. And so this is now getting into um, you know, what are the financial statements? How, how are they organized? And of course, there's a whole industry around, uh, around this. And um, there are three basic types of, of financial statements. They are completely uh, interrelated, and each one serves a different purpose. Um, tonight, we're going to be focused on the balance sheet. Um, but I want to describe it and the other two so that we have a sense of the balance sheet in the context of the whole suite of financial statements. So um, the balance sheet describes the owner's position in the business. It describes um, the financial condition of the organization. Um, it is a snapshot of the financial condition uh, at a moment in time. Balance sheet is always dated with a, a specific date because it is saying, look, based on the information that is available at this moment, here is the picture of the, um, of the organization's financial position. Um, as we're going to talk about, it, it goes into detail about what the co-op has and where it came from. Um, this tool, the balance sheet, is really different from the income statement and the cash flow statement. The income statement, which is also known as a profit and loss or a statement of operations, tells a story about what's going on in the organization during a time period. So it might be a week or a quarter or a year, and it has records all of the um, transactions of the organization during that time, and it and it organizes them in this, you know, sales and expenses and profit um, kind of structure. Um, and then at the beginning of the next period, it resets all those categories over to zero. So it's very helpful in terms of measuring um, performance, profitability. Um, it's a tremendous, you know, management tool, obviously, for um, being able to to manage all of those relationships of income and expenses. Um, it shows, obviously, if the co-op has made money or lost money and how much. Uh, the 
cash flow statement is really about cash only. It doesn't show the financial condition of, a, of the organization. It doesn't show profitability. It shows what kind of cash came in and how it was used. Um, very handy uh, document if your job is managing cash flow or if you're really monitoring uh, those aspects of, of the business of, of you know, how the cash is moving through the organization. Um, the most interesting way that I've come to think of balance sheets in relationship with these uh, other reports and this is described in the um, in the Coop Grocer article, and we're gonna we're gonna use this idea tonight a little bit. Is that um, the balance sheet? Uh, one balance sheet is like a snapshot. And what's really interesting then is if you um, compare snapshots. So each picture gives you a sense of the financial condition at that moment. But when you compare two or more pictures, you also can see that uh, change has occurred and that there was a story in between the two pictures. And um, for me, the, the, um, the fun kind of real life example is, is if you uh, look at a photo album of, of a person growing up and you see the picture of you know a baby and then you're one and you're five and you're ten and twenty and thirty and each picture you know is really kind of special moment maybe and but then you see that wow things have really changed uh, between you know this year one and year thirty um, and it's really represented in each picture and what's going on in between so we're going to we're going to really work on that uh kind of developing that longer view uh tonight and see uh you know what's up with some of these relationships around um debt to equity and current ratio or or some of these indicators so that's the um that's the the, the quick overview on financial statements and i came across a book um it's going to come up on your screen here in a minute that um, I think I I first found this book in um, in the early 1980s, and uh, I was thinking maybe even it was in the Whole Earth Catalog or Coevolution Quarterly or something, and um, uh, and, and probably a very you know first or second edition, and uh, I've bought it three times uh, since the, you know since then, and it's now in the sixth edition, and this guy John Tracy. Uh, does a, just a fantastic job of illustrating the relationships between the three types of reports. Um, really, as you can see in this, you know, example I'm showing you, um, this is the uh, in, how the income statement relates to the balance sheet, and you know, you can see that it is very, very uh, interconnected. And then this little chart down here is the balance sheet and um, uh, and oh, it's a change of balance sheet and I, think, I thought I was putting one in here for uh, cash flow but if it isn't then there certainly is one and then in his book he really talks about each specific uh, relationship um, so if you're interested in going into detail and in how these are uh, interconnected I highly recommend this book um, tonight we're gonna uh, I think really work enough on the balance sheet so that um, hopefully you'll you'll have a good picture of of what's going on with that um, you might not be able to see it that well but here is one and um, and then there's another uh, there's another balance sheet sample uh, that comes up later on in the session so here we're going to start the the balance sheet lesson So we're going to use uh, some unconventional terminology in the beginning to uh, to just build up our understanding of of, uh, of how these things work. So uh, we're going to use the word stuff. And what I want you to do is imagine all the stuff your co-op owns. All right, just kind of get a picture of of all of that. So you know, what's it look like? What? Give me some examples of um, of 
of things that your co-op owns that would be uh, making up part of this uh, picture here of, of stuff. You know, some ideas. You know, I'll throw in, you know, cash in the bank. Uh, we have uh, physical plant equipment. Thank you. Uh, inventory. Um, tofu. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, thanks. Um, and, you know, really, we, we have a lot of, of stuff. Um, uh, income from tenants is, uh, is, is going to be slightly different. What you would do is you'd say, well, let's say we get income from tenants, and then that's actually money. And so it's money that we have, and we're going to put that in the bank. So we would say, oh, we have a bank account with money in it. Um, and at that point, it wouldn't be necessarily thought of as, oh, that's the money that's income uh, from, you know, tofu or tenants. It would just be that it's money. We have that, All right? And um, uh, freezers and coolers and ovens and dishwashers and shelving. And, you know, maybe maybe we own uh, our, our piece of land or our building. Um, you know, all that stuff is stuff. Um, so that's good. Kind of builds up a, a picture of, of stuff that we have. And, uh, and then the question is, well, you know, where did it come from? All right? And tonight we're going to learn that our stuff comes from two places. It comes from inside. And that's what we're going to focus on right now. And so the question is, um, uh, how do we how do we um, generate um, funds from the inside of our of our organization? You know how does that um, how does that happen? And uh, going back to income from tenants, yep. If we end up having income come in at the top of the income statement, and we have all of our expenses, and at the bottom of, bottom of our income statement we have made some money then that would be one way that we're generating um, funds to pay for our stuff um, so actually I just gave you part of uh, one of the answers um, anybody want to answer it for me though so I can say it out loud <laughs> right so we we're selling all of this food and doing all this business and we have all these expenses and at the bottom of the uh, income statement what is it that we have cool thanks earnings so part of the money from inside is earnings and that is one of the cool things about the co-op model which is that our our our, um, our organization is really fueled in part by the, the net income that our operation uh, generates. So what's another example of, of funds that come from, uh, let's say, inside the organization? Excellent. Thank you. Member equity. Right. So our members pay in, uh, they buy shares, okay? And those are really the two primary um, uh, forms of, of funds that are generated by our organizations from the inside that help us do buy, uh, help us uh, fund our stuff. So now the other big category of where our stuff comes from is outside. So if the green is uh, earnings and paid-in member equity. Um, what do we? What what's going on with uh, the idea that we're getting money from outside the organization? What do we know about that kind of money? What do you think? Oh, we have to pay it back. <laughs> you know, we've got loans, right? Loans, debt, and we're going to pay it back. So that's a lot different from uh, the money down here. Uh, because the earnings that we make um, uh, are really generated by the organization as as fuel for use, and uh, members pay in uh, to the organization to help uh, the organization 
have adequate capital. And then in addition to those two, this red area here is uh, uh, fuel that we put in the organization uh, with the intent that we're going to pay it back, all right? Coming from outside the organization and its debt. So there's the two, uh, the two categories of where our stuff comes from. So now just to put that into um, accounting speak, we're going to say that uh, stuff equals assets. So when we imagine all that stuff that we have uh, uh, on the balance sheet, it's going to be called assets. When we think about um, uh, where our stuff came from, we're going to see that it comes from inside the organization and outside the organization. And from inside, it's usually two categories. Um, uh, earnings slash income and member paid in equity and outside it's going to be money that we're going to pay back. Um, so here comes the the basic formula for the balance sheet which is that assets always equal liabilities plus equity. So you can see in our chart here that we've got the same total amount of stuff as we have the sum of uh, liabilities plus equity. Why is that true? Why, does that, um, wh why is that real? It's real because all our stuff has to come from somewhere. It either comes from outside the organization or inside. And this is just like a fundamental element of stuff. <laughs> right? And it's also like a very important accounting rule. So if someone says, hey, we're going to go buy a building, you say, well, gee, where's that building going to come from? And it's probably going to be a combination of inside and outside. Uh, funding sources. So um, that was a moment in time. One, you know, one uh, specific. Well, let me go back there uh, to just show the relationship. In this picture, um, the stuff is coming from equal parts outside and inside. All right, equal parts. So now we're going to go and see three different pictures. All right, so this one is that same picture, equal parts inside and outside. Um, this one has more from outside, so more debt and less equity. And this one has less debt and more equity. All right, so again, if you just think about the balance sheet as providing you with this specific information, your assets and your debt and your equity, um, it's going to change over time. Each, each balance sheet is going to be a snapshot. And, um, and so here's three different pictures of, of uh, financial condition as it is represented in debt to equity. So let's get a little bit more specific. How would these relationships be expressed? So, because there's a little, you know, special lingo here that's used when we're talking about the debt to equity uh, uh, ratio. All right. So, uh, anyone want to offer it up for example number one here? How is that normally uh, expressed? So we have equal parts debt to equity. Cool, thanks. So this one is numerically represented like that, and you would say it as one to one. All right, that's what this one is. And um, we're going to do all three. So if you want to, uh, anyone wants to jump ahead. So what that's saying is, look, these are equal. And um, so one-to-one -one relationship. So how about number two? We've got more debt than the last one. So how would that be expressed? So this one is two-to-one. So that means we've got two parts debt to one part equity. All right, that's what it's saying. So if you put dollars into that, 
look for every two dollars of debt we have one dollar of equity okay so when we say where did our so over here uh, of course I should have used a total of 12 sorry <laughs> there if we say we have four look at that if we have 12 units of of stuff um, in this model eight come from uh, eight come from debt and four come from within all right now the next one here is a little bit tricky because we've got more uh, equity than debt and in this case uh, we're going to call it 0.33 to 1 okay so the thing about um, the debt to equity ratio is that the equity is always expressed as one and the other number varies. Okay, and we'll see that again when we look at the current ratio. So that one's a little bit trickier to, uh, to express, but when you look at it uh, visually, you can see that we've got uh, three times more equity then we have, um, well, actually, is it one? Sorry. Uh, yeah, three times. Did I get that right? It's actually kind of tricky because it's in the middle there. Oh, yeah, one, two, three. Thanks. So um, um, then the other interesting question is to ask, uh, well, gee, is, is uh, you know, is one of these better than the other? You know, is it okay? Uh, is is any one of these okay? Um, so, obviously, more green might be good, um, but in fact, sometimes more red is totally fine. So, how do we know the answer um, to the question? Is it okay? Is this is this particular financial condition that's represented on the balance sheet right now, um, you know, should I feel okay about it? So, it depends. <laughs> it's a very important piece of accounting terminology. <laughs> oh, I should add, I am definitely not an accountant. <laughs> So, um, what does it depend on? It depends on what's going on. Uh, what's going on out, you know, beyond this snapshot, this moment in time? How does this particular financial condition connect to what's happened in the past and what is coming for the future? All right, that is the really the the best way to think about. Uh, a current financial condition. So um, now what we're going to do is look at uh, three different um, uh, comparisons or say photo galleries. If you think of each balance sheet as a snapshot, we're going to look at the, um, uh, in, in this case, nine, nine years of, of uh, comparison balance sheet information. So what we can see is uh, this this co-op started with uh, 10 units of stuff in year one and in year nine ended up with 30 units of stuff so for me a really basic great question when it comes to thinking about um, what's going on in the organization as well uh, what's going on with our stuff do we have more of it or less of it or is it staying the same? So in this case, we've got this pattern of change. We've got three times more stuff. So based on the work that we did a minute ago, what is uh, the next really interesting question to ask once you have a sense of what's going on with stuff? Cool. Where did the stuff come from? <laughs> right. So um, uh, 
uh, and we want to know. We want to know. Look, we've got three times more stuff, and uh, and now we want to know, like, how did that happen? And just a clarification of the picture, uh, each one of these pairings, right, is meant to be a balance sheet. So we're going to compare those two with these two, all right? And the yellow, uh, and I hope it's showing up okay, it's showing up okay on mine, uh, is uh, the stuff, right, or the assets. And then the column next door is where the stuff came from, which is a stacked column of, of um, inside and outside or equity and liabilities. All right. So we figured out that we have three times more stuff. So what's going on um, with where it came from? So we've got some growth in equity. Oops. Sorry, flashback. Let's try that again. We've got some growth here in equity. We know that equity comes from two places. So, um, you know, it looks like we were either making some money here or that we, um, we added more members, right? And then it's kind of leveling off. And then we have this growth, oops, and then a dip, and then a growth. So that's the, that's the money that is coming from inside the organization, and we know it's coming from two places. Sorry to sound like a broken record, but it's either going to be coming from net income. So all of that action that's coming off of the income statement that is basically uh, resulting in the bottom line of, gee, did we make money or not? Is there earnings at the end of the year? Uh, those earnings are going to come over here and be part of this green. And oftentimes when you see something like this, you see that a co-op has hit a scale of operation maybe where they're generating a lot more net income, right? Um, something like this dip here might be that as a result of this change in stuff, like maybe there was an expansion or something really did change, they went from 20 units to 28 units of, of stuff, that oftentimes when that happens, there's a period of loss that, um, you know, so for a little while or maybe a, a, even a series of years, the co-op incurs a net loss um, that would make your, um, your equity go down because your earnings would be a negative number. Um, so what's going on with the with the debt side of this picture? Um, when we started in year nine, you know, it looks like we had five units of debt, and that pretty much held for the next year. We grew some some uh, some some green. We we added some some uh, earnings or some member paid in capital, and then the next year. We took on some more debt, but when you look at this balance, we're still really in kind of this one-to-one uh, -one relationship. And then what happened? We leveraged the, um, the equity and added more debt so that we could make this leap in stuff. All right. So if you were looking at just this picture alone, um, and said, gee, is that okay uh, that we have probably a two-to-one uh, relationship with uh, debt to equity? Um, you'd say, well, in this case, I would say they planned for it. It looks like it was very purposeful that they built up their equity here so that they could take on that additional debt and add stuff. And then in the course of the next three years, they improved their financial uh, condition, reduced their debt. Why? So that they can take on more debt and grow again. All right. So um, that picture is uh, possibly kind of a classic, um, you know, nine-year expansion model where they did a couple of, you know, significant projects. Uh, one happened right here and one happened right here and in between they were following through and building financial uh, financial strength
So we're going to go and look at two other uh, scenarios. And again, these are uh, the, the data that we're working with, these three uh, ideas are just completely uh, balance sheet um, relationships. All right. So let's take a look at um, at the next one. So what do you think is going on here? What is what? So the first question is, um, let's practice the question. The question is, uh, what's happening with our stuff? <laughs> stuff right more less same All right so in this case we uh, we see that we have very slow growth in stuff over nine years uh, really uh, going from you know 10 to 15 uh, in comparison to going from 10 to 30 All right so we know what's going on with our stuff. You know, not exactly the same, but uh, slightly more, but emphasis on, on slow. Um, so where's stuff coming from? What can we say about, uh, about our stuff here? Cool. So our stuff here is really coming from within the organization. It is really um, either just you know we have a we have a, a profitable operation that doesn't rely on having more stuff, and uh, and we're generating a net income. Maybe there's either net income or additional paid-in members, and um, and the result of that. Uh, combination of not having more stuff and having kind of a slow growth in the equity is that the debt is um, is really being paid off and and really in the end uh, very small so the question is you know well is that okay and um, you know of course this is a that's a, um, a values um, uh, decision that a board would be faced with is saying we could uh, take this uh, equity position that we have here and add on a lot of more stuff. We could be a lot more leveraged here and add to our assets by taking on more debt. That's a possibility. Well, the way we say it in the article and in here, we say it, it may be failing to leverage the member's assets, or perhaps the co-op is looking forward to possibilities that will serve members and others better. In other words, like what we don't know is what's coming up, right? So all we know now is that really they don't owe very much money and they have a very strong uh, equity position. Okay. So we'll do one more. Um, so what's going on with the stuff? Take a look. This is really an important question. Sounds kind of silly. <laughs> but um, as you can see in this picture, uh, having a good understanding of what's going on with your stuff is really important. Because in this case, there's a downward trend of stuff. There's also a downward trend of equity. So if we start with, hey, what's going on with our stuff? And then ask, and where's our stuff coming from? Um, sorry, this is pretty sloppy. In this case, um, they have negative, their equity is shrinking. We just talked about the um, uh, that equity is the sum of earnings or net income and uh, member paid in capital. And so the way that uh, equity base like this shrinks is there's you know accumulation of negative 
earnings or losses. So it's likely that this co-op is losing money over a period of years and um, and their stuff in the end here in this year is largely coming from debt. All right? You can see that we've got a little bit of paid in equity probably left there. Probably have a big net earnings number. And then this is a happy story because they do something right here <laughs> and turn it around. Right? So this is a this is a we have some cake here uh, in year nine, and it's a good story to tell that that um, you know we almost had no equity at all, and then the next year we probably started making money again. Um, and making a little more money and growing and building our base and and lo and behold back here in year nine we end up with a one-to-one -one relationship between debt and equity um, for all of our stuff right so then now maybe you're in a position to say um, now we could uh, add that picture on to say this first one and back here this is a one-to-one -one relationship and maybe that co-op is at the beginning of some kind of a pattern like this, right? Or, I suppose, uh, could be a pattern like that. But hopefully not going to repeat uh, the pattern of going back down again. So the lesson here is to... Um, is to just have in your in your mind that when you're looking at a balance sheet, you are seeing um, uh, numbers that are a snapshot, and you should be wondering um, if uh, you know why it's like this and what path what path uh, the co-op is on um, with these key categories of assets, uh, debt, and, and equity, all right? And, <laughs> yeah, this is a, a great comment uh, is, uh, that this picture here might be illustrating what happens when you give a discount at the register and not know if you're making money or not, uh, and then changing to patronage rebate and being able to manage your, uh, your member discounts. That's very very much possibility and also could just be indicative of an organization that um, that you know just doesn't make money for a period of years and and there are plenty in our um, in co-op history that uh, had you know really thriving and uh, and financially strong um, uh, financial condition and then you know because of just you know what what happened it ends up in a very very weak position this is a very difficult position to recover from you have to really have all hands on deck and have great alignment and have great management in order to turn around a situation like that um, so uh, let's kind of drill into those columns um, and add some more detail uh, so again this is our stuff column and all stuff is not um, exactly alike. Uh, there's two broad um, categories. There are a few more categories, but um, right now we're just going to talk about the idea of current. All right. So um, some of our stuff is current stuff, and what that and in this picture. Is the splits right here, and what's on top is current. The way that current is um, usually defined is stuff that the co-op owns that um, is fairly liquid, that is kind of like cash. It doesn't have to be just cash. Uh, in our business, it could also be inventory. And the rule of thumb is current stuff is stuff that could be cash, during the um, next 12 months, or that it's expected that it's going to be cash in the next 12 months. Um, so pretty, pretty much it's going to be actually cash 
and inventory combined to make up current stuff. Um, there's a reason why we want to know how much current stuff we have, and that is because we have uh, all debt is not the same either. There is a category of debt that is called current debt, and it is pretty much defined in the same way, meaning that debt that is going to need to be paid in the next 12 months. So you can see what they're doing is kind of setting us up to see a relationship between uh, current stuff and current debt. All right, so right there. So that is the combination of current stuff, current debt, and it's called the current ratio. So it's expressed in a very specific way too. All right, so anybody want to um, share what this particular um, current ratio is? Cool. So um, in the as it's expressed here in the columns, we have uh, four parts of current stuff and two parts of current debt. But just like in the debt to equity uh, relationship, the current ratio is always expressed with a one as current debt. So in this particular case, it's going to be a two to one relationship. So what that means is that for every dollar that um, we owe in the next 12 months, we have two dollars in current stuff. And basically, uh, so that's a, you would say, oh, well, gee, we should be able to pay our, we should be able to meet our obligations then because we have twice as much current stuff as we have current debt. And um, as they uh, get closer together, meaning that if it was, say, um, a one-to-one, -one, like if it was right here to right here, then you still say, oh, well, we have enough um, current stuff to cover our current debt, and yet it just means that also cash needs to be managed efficiently. And sometimes you'll see even organizations with less than a one-to-one -one relationship and um, seems to work out what's going on there is that the cash is being managed, uh, you know, very, very efficiently so that its obligations are being met. Um, but certainly kind of a one-to-one -one is a benchmark and stronger is, um, you know, we have co-ops that have uh, lots of cash. They might be, um, they might be building up to, to do a project or something. So let's see. So there you have the current ratio, right? Um, the, uh, this is showing the member paid in and earnings split. Right? And in fact, this particular balance sheet, if you want to call it that, is the um, financial picture of, it's kind of the average of all the co-ops from the data that was uh, uh, published in, I think it was the 2005 Co-op Grocer Operational Survey, that if you looked at all the co-ops together, we had a two to one uh, current ratio. Right, So we can see that right here, two to one current ratio we see that we have a one-to-one -one, uh, debt to equity ratio, right? That would be these two. And then the equity is split also one-to-one. Uh, -one. So that half of our equity overall is coming from earnings and half of our equity is coming from paid-in uh, capital. That was, uh, that was the aggregate uh, picture of all the co-ops a couple years ago. So now we'll get into just an um, actual balance sheet. This is how it looks, uh, except usually, of course, it has numbers. So this is just, this is showing numbers, but you'd have, you know, um, dollars here. And um, but this is the way it's usually structured with uh, assets, current, other, total. And in this case, uh, we're showing 40%, 60%, and 100% of our assets. So 
there's our all of our stuff okay and then these two are combined right back to our picture so this is our red column and we're going to have a number that shows current liabilities and long-term liabilities and total so this number here would be our total red and then uh, this is how much is due in the next 12 months and this is the debt that we have that's due after 12 months right so beyond 12 months we're not we're not paying for the long-term stuff uh, in the coming year so if we look right now we can see that current liabilities to current assets there's our four to two or two to one relationship all right and then we come down here to equity and we see that um, really equal parts member paid in and earnings um, and then if we look here at our uh, debt to equity we've got a one-to-one -one. and then lastly we want to see that all of our assets had to come from somewhere and it came from the sum of liabilities and equity so that right there is a uh, an actual balance sheet and you want to be able to say oh look <laughs> this looks all messy right now but um, uh, here are the relationships that are described in that in that document as the um, as the governors, the overseers, we do want to be able to understand what those relationships are telling us. Now you can see if you get a balance sheet with just this one year, you don't see the uh, this this kind of information, right? It's just not it's just not there. So um, as a director, you want to be we want to be looking at it this way and so you know how do I how do I ask for the information that's gonna help me tell the story um, so what's happening with our assets are they going up down or staying the same are we profitable why or why not so we would know if we're profitable or not because part of our equity is coming from earnings right so on the balance sheet look for uh, look for earnings so do you have to know how to run a grocery store to look at a balance sheet and find out if you're making money? No. Just look for the earnings line. Um, why or why not? You might not, uh, it might not be planned right now that you're going to be profitable. Maybe you've just gone through some project you're going to lose and you're going to lose money. The question is, is there, uh, is there a reason that you're not, uh, that you're not profitable or are you in a picture like this where we have a downward trend and then a near-death experience um, can we meet our obligations so you're looking at really this situation right here the current ratio in terms of can we pay our bills and then this this bigger relationship between debt and equity of like you know, gee, are we leveraged in an appropriate manner for the organization? Let's see, what's another great que uh, question? How much capital have members invested? All right, so in the picture, that's going to be right here, the light green. How much of our stuff is a result of members uh, participating by paying in uh, by paying in capital. We know that they're participating by shopping and if the store is being managed right we're going to make a net income off of every purchase that's going to show up in earnings but how about the owner's stake in the organization? So um, let's see the um, what we're going to do next is just chat for a minute about the idea of fiduciary responsibility. So um, we have created a picture of the balance sheet 
um, hopefully when you when you get one and I'll come back and and we can poke around and ask questions on it in a minute but uh, let's move through this this other topic uh, first of uh, fiduciary responsibility so the way we tend to think of it is this simple have expectations assign responsibility and check um, and that if you uh, if you can set up uh, pre-established criteria so that we have some expectations about what is supposed to be going on or some boundaries or just have uh, have an expression uh, from the board intending to safeguard financial condition uh, guide fiscal planning and ensure asset protection um, that is step one um, if you do this, then when you're actually in uh, circumstances, you will be able to compare and relate to whatever's going on with what the original expectations were, as opposed to um, just reacting to whatever it is that's going on. Um, it's very likely that the board is assigning responsibility uh, um, downstream and that you're going to end up checking and monitoring uh, compliance rather than actually being in the thick of it. So what this means is that you are evaluating and judging, right? So I have um, uh, the sample policies from our sample set that, that uh, we feel really do take into account the types of things that you would be uh, looking at, and we'll just quickly review those. Um, they are expressed um, within the policy governance terminology. If you're not using policy governance, what you could do is look for the content and see what's going on at the content level and express the policies in whatever um, framework that you're using. Um, the, the policies that I'm showing you are set up as constraints uh, or boundaries and at the top level at the global level it's saying hey um, let's not be imprudent <laughs> it's not okay to be imprudent and in addition it's also not okay to violate commonly accepted businesses business and professional ethics and practices so you know as we'll see we'll drill into it a little bit the idea of you know making big decisions without um, adequate due diligence would you know in today's world not be um, likely to be commonly accepted um, just a note here we have uh, recently um, uh, revised our sample set and we feel really good about it um, it's, it's really very different from sample sets that were um, that were distributed and, and used as references even a few years ago so um, feel free to ask us for a copy we'll be happy to um, to hand it over to you and talk to you about it um, stepping inside of that global that global idea of avoiding imprudence uh, typically you would see a financial conditions and activities policy again at the top level you would say hey uh, you need to demonstrate to us that we're avoiding fiscal jeopardy very key idea um, lets you sleep at night and then more specifically um, here are some further points uh, and we've talked about them tonight uh, relating to sales relating to net income uh, relating to liquidity solvency indebtedness All right so when you're thinking about assessing financial condition of the organization the things that we've just talked about really are some of the key ingredients to um, financial conditions and in particular avoiding jeopardy All right what's going on with sales we're saying here hey it's not okay if sales decline or become stagnant we're saying, hey, it's not okay if you don't generate uh, an adequate net income. Um, we have expectations around adequate liquidity and solvency. Um, one thing you'll notice in our policy set here, we have we have gone to the non-specific control. Um, so it doesn't say, for example, hey, it's not okay if you don't generate a two percent net income. 
The reason for that is because in these, um, uh, if we go back up, say, to the, that nine-year picture, um, you know, adequate net income might vary. And instead of having the burden on the board to set benchmarks and really do the analysis of what is it uh, take to avoid jeopardy or what are we trying to achieve, um, this structure allows it to be uh, delegated and then reported back to the board uh, by management. So if you have uh, uh, specifics in your financial conditions policy, you might take this up uh, as an interesting topic to talk about. Another area of, uh, of policy uh, is the business planning and financial budgeting. And, you know, basically it's, again, talking about the idea of, of thinking ahead and avoiding jeopardy. All right, so um, let's just whiz back here to, for example, right here. And excuse me just for a minute, I'm just going to uh, see if I can erase some stuff here. Well, it's not that easy, so I won't. I forget how to do it, actually. So let's say that, um, that uh, where I'm drawing this line, uh, these years have not happened yet, right? So that would mean that this is now, right? So that would mean that years one through five have taken place, and years one through five would have been reported uh, through the monitoring process. Um, but years six through nine would actually be uh, things that are planned, right? So that's you know part of the uh, answer to is it okay that our financial condition is looking like this right now in year five and part of the answer is well like what are we trying to achieve in this case you would probably have an expectation that you know within this two-year window there's going to be a pretty big change here in the organization and that maybe that's actually reflected in the in the um, in the plans uh, for the future of the organization so in that case having expectations around um, what type of, of uh, financial planning is going on, uh, you know, what's involved in the depth of the, uh, of the analysis, have we tested it for feasibility, um, some things like that. So this type of pre-established criteria is really going to help uh, the board do its job when it's in the, in the judging and evaluating phase. And then the third part of the suite is, uh, is asset protection. And this top level is, you know, if you think of now uh, assets as stuff, <laughs> it's saying, hey, we want to protect our stuff, so it's not okay if our stuff is unprotected or unreasonably risked or uh, inadequately maintained. And so this, again, is part of your, your checking process um, uh, to know that, you know, your stuff is actually okay and... Um, and you're going to have a, a report back uh, that is demonstrating that. So that's part of the, um, you know, necessary um, system of fiduciary responsibility. We're going to have expectations that we just quickly ran through uh, the key three categories that are underneath this idea, global uh, idea of, uh, of not being imprudent. Um, certainly we should be realizing that uh, we've assigned responsibility and uh, and holding someone other than the board uh, accountable for actually doing all of this stuff. And then the board has to check and has to be able to demonstrate that it does check and that it has a good system for, um, for doing that job. Um, and then I'm going to just throw this picture up here. This is a picture that uh, Thane Joyal and um, and Marshall Kovitz used in their um, in their webinar roles and responsibilities. And if you so, what I'm saying here is that when you're when you're doing this job of judging, um, what's what's essential is that you're you're uh, you're t you're doing that act based on the concept of reasonableness. And um, 
and for uh, uh, elaboration on the concept of, of reasonableness, um, uh, I invite you to, to view the webinar on roles and responsibility of subdirectors. A great example, though, that they used was the speed limit sign that says, hey, the speed limit in the daytime is reasonable and prudent. At, at night, it's 65. <laughs> and trucks are 65 but daytime for cars is reasonable and prudent and I really think that that kind of thinking applies when you are um, uh, working with a balance sheet and you're in the mode of it depends is this level of indebtedness okay it depends um, what's happening with our stuff uh, and why is that okay it depends um, you really want to to be looking for the, the bigger context. Um, let's see, a question came in. What's an example of assets that are unprotected? Um, well, in fact, uh, if we look at this more specific uh, list here, uh, the point of sub policies is to be more specific to the, to the top level. So at the top level, we say it's not OK to have assets be unprotected. and um, and down here, it might be that, for example, um, if assets were inadequately insured, uh, they would be unprotected. So, in fact, in um, you know, insurance is a really easy one to get your head around because it's commonly accepted that you're you're going for a level of insurance of 90%. And so, you know, on a, on a some kind of periodic basis, you know, obviously not daily, weekly monthly, but perhaps annually or maybe every other year, you're checking in with the value of the co-op's assets to see if they're adequately protected with insurance. If, um, if they're not, then uh, the insurance would need to be uh, up upgraded. And so for the board to do its job, it's making this type of a statement and then looking to see back what type of, of response it's getting regarding uh, demonstrating adequate insurance. Good question, though. So um, any that really does uh, um, reach the end of the balance sheet presentation. Um, it is written up um, in the Co-op Grocer article, and uh, that is a good written record of the same process. We do teach this, uh, this process um, in the CBO 101. We use Legos. Um, so your new directors that come on board, send them to the CBO 101s, and they, we actually, in, in the CBO 101, build um, this type of thing without the scribbling, um, and I'll, this type of thing without the scribbling, with your actual data. We usually do three to five years of history. And, um, and, and, and then it's also kind of interesting, too, if there's a question, like if we go back up to... Um, to this one, sometimes we speculate on the future, <laughs> right? So like in this case, uh, we had a co-op uh, a couple of years ago that uh, was in the CBO 101, and they were right here uh, in this year, year five, and they had just a tiny bit of green, and um, we speculated of what, you know, the turnaround uh, might look like, and in fact, it, look, it would have looked like this, in their case, they uh, they didn't make it; they uh, had to close. Um, the there's a question about um, uh, retained patronage uh, refunds and or uh, patronage dividends, and, uh, and and those are thought of as part of earnings, as opposed to part of member paid in. Great question. Uh, since, you know, in the broader, in, at least in the, uh, you might actually see three categories in the green that would give it its own, uh, its own space, but in a two-category model, it's not, um, it's not really a function of, of share investment, which is the point of the member paid in, and it's more of a function of, uh, of the surplus or the profits of the co-op. That's a good, nice, specific question. Thanks. Um, any other questions about the balance sheet or um, the idea of having pre-established criteria in 
those key categories and having a way to um, to demonstrate um, compliance in those areas and keep the speed limit sign in mind as that comes back up on your screen. Uh, I appreciate your attendance tonight and certainly if you um, have any questions on on this your uh, C-Build uh, consultant can help you and um, I'm just putting up here uh, the schedule we've done the building a board budget acting on GM monitoring reports roles and responsibilities recruiting new directors the dealing with complaints from staff and members has been rescheduled I'm about to announce that uh, tonight or tomorrow it's going to be coming up on Wednesday October 22nd um, we're doing the balance sheet uh, we've done GM compensation economic participation boards role and expansion and dialogue so it looks like we're got nine out of twelve done and the nine that have done the recordings are all um, useful and so I invite you to what you have to do is register for those sessions and then you get access um, well, we do have a couple of ideas in mind of simplifying that process but for now it's you know it's not not too hard we've had uh, I think almost 300 directors enroll uh, this year for various classes um, and I appreciate your your participation tonight. Thanks so much for coming and um, have a great rest of your week. Okay, I'm going to end the session and um, please do, if the evaluation survey comes up on your screen, it'll take like a minute. If it doesn't show up, it's going to come to you in an email um, in about an hour or sometime. And that was a, a new button I found and I tried it out and I thought it would be immediate. <laughs> So I, I do hope it comes up on your screen now. So thanks a lot, and uh, see you around. Bye.